Good morning. Good morning. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder if there's anyone else here who has also had a really hard job. I'm not talking about mentally or emotionally stressful. I'm talking about manual labor, I'm talking about really hard work. When I think back throughout my entire life and all the different jobs I've had, I think the hardest job physically was tree work, cutting trees down. If you've ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. It's really not easy. And the kind of tree work that I did wasn't the kind of tree work where you could use a bucket. We didn't have that much money, like a lift, although I probably wouldn't want to get up in that thing anyway. But the trees would often be in spots that were hard to get to. So you have two jobs. You have the climbers, and then you have the ground people. And the climbers, they're pretty skilled. They wear stirrups on their feet. They have a belt with the chainsaw hanging off of it and a rope. You put it around the tree, and this is kind of how you shimmy up the tree. And once they get up there, they very surgically, they call them tree surgeons sometimes, cut the limbs off. And they're notching them and dropping them. There's a whole science to it. That was not me. <laughs> I was the guy on the ground. And if you're going to be one of the ground guys, you got to be pretty strong. Because once they give the all clear, it's my turn to come in with the chainsaw and chop up the pieces of wood. But here's the thing. You don't want to chop it into little tiny pieces because then you're running back and forth a lot to the truck. It takes a lot of time and energy. So you got to have pretty large pieces of wood. And they're really, really heavy. This was hard work, very cumbersome, really difficult job, tree work. But what a lot of people don't know about it is this. There's the obvious, that you're cutting down the tree because it's become cumbersome. It's too large for the space that it's in. It poses a threat to perhaps a home or something like that. The original property owner didn't think when they planted the little seed that it would turn into a great big tree. What a lot of people don't know it can be a little dangerous, especially for the climbers, because some of the greatest trees, some of the biggest trees out there, are really hollow and rotten on the inside. Today, we continue in our series, The Rest of the Story. Last week, we looked at Samson, where we saw that, like the big trees, Samson was great on the outside, but kind of weak on the inside. And this is where most close the book of Judges. In fact, if you've done the program as a church, the story, it literally cuts off the next five chapters. It's not there. It actually says that. It talks about Samson, and oh, by the way, there's some other things happened, and enter Ruth. That is exactly what it says. It literally redacts the chapters we're going to be looking at. From the program to the pulpit. This is what the church does. And I have mixed feelings about it. I'll tell you why. 
On one hand, I get what I think is the intended purpose. I know this was the purpose when we did the stories at church, is that you figure people are going to get a Cliff's Notes version, maybe a little better than that of the Bible. Then all of a sudden, they're going to get really interested, and they're going to go home and say, wow, I want to read the rest of the story. But from my experience, that is not what happened. People were content to give themselves a gold star and say, yay, I read the Bible. But that's not true. There's a lot more to it. And so I have mixed feelings about it because pastors know this. We know that most people aren't reading the Bible, and we know that when we present the Cliff's Notes version, what do you do in school? Do you then go, oh, I want to read the whole book. Who's done that? All right, you do the Cliff's Notes for the younger kids. I don't know if they have them anymore. The Cheater Guide. It's a little short version, right? And that's how you cheat, and then you do your little book report. But how many of you did that and then read the whole book? No. So it doesn't happen with the Bible either. And so pastors know this. After I discovered this, I'm like, okay, we're not going to do that again. That doesn't work. It didn't get people in there. And they keep doing it. Here's the other thing. And this is what surprises me. That a lot of pastors will give approval to TV programs about the Bible, different kinds of programs that redact stuff from God's story or add to it. God's word tells us not to do that very specifically in several places. Why? Because his word is perfect. We don't have to take anything away. We might miss something important. We don't have to add anything to it. It is perfect. Yet, so many Christians love these programs with all this extra stuff put in there. Now think about it. Even in the secular world, what happens if it's your favorite book? Right? Some book you liked, I don't know, whatever it is, Lord of the Rings, right? And then they make a movie about it. And the director decides, eh, it's not really good enough. Let's take this out. Let's add this. What's the standard by which we measure that movie? Well, how close to the book they got it. That's what we all say, right? The book was better. Eh, it really wasn't like the book. You should really read the book. It was my favorite book. And some take offense because it's like the director saying, well, I can write the story better than that person. So what are we doing when we change God's story? Are we saying we can write it better than he can? So it surprises me when so many people watch these shows and love these shows. I think, why? Maybe because it's not their favorite book. But we at C3 Church believe that this is perfect in every way, shape, and form. So when we teach on it, there is nothing added, nothing taken away. And that's kind of what this series is all about. So today we're going to look at Judges 17 through 21, where we'll see that there is more to the story in the book of Judges. There's a theme of hypocrisy. And so this is appearing to be great or doing good things on the outside, but on the inside, there are lots of problems. Judges 17, starting at verse 1. There was a man named Micah who lived in the hill country of Ephraim. One day, he said to his mother, I heard you placed a curse on the person who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. Well, I have the money. I was the one who took it. The Lord bless you for admitting it, his mother replied. He returned the money to her, and she said, I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord. Good. In honor of my son, I will have an image carved in an idol cast. Bad. So when he returned the money to his mother, she took 200 silver coins and gave them to a silversmith who made them into an image and an idol. And these were placed in Micah's house. Micah set up a shrine for the idol and he made a sacred ephod and some household idols. Then he installed one of his sons as a personal priest. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So right out the gate, there's like this hypocrisy, right? Oh, I'm going to honor the Lord, but I'm going to make an idol. So if you've been paying attention, 1,100 pieces of silver, this is what each one of the Philistine kings offered to Delilah to betray Samson. If we keep reading, we'll see that there's a little more to this story. 
A Levite shows up. He's from Bethlehem in Judah. And so Micah offers him a job. Ten pieces of silver a year, a change of clothing, I'll put you up, you're good. So he accepts the job. And what he's doing here is he's trying to legitimize this idolatry. He even says, I know the Lord will bless me because I have a Levite as a priest. If you know anything about the word, you know that the Levites were the ones who could be priests. Hypocrisy. Judges 18, starting at verse 1. Now in those days, Israel had no king, and the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle, for they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshtaol to scout out a land for them to settle in. So if you're paying attention, numbers again, how many kings were there? Five. How many warriors sent out? Five. You're going to see this repeating theme of numbers. So here's what they do. They go to scout out the land. So the land, it was divided in Joshua, if you remember that, the allocation of the land. Some of the tribes haven't settled in. Dan is one of them. They haven't settled into their, their land yet, their allotted land. So they're like, okay, let's go scout it out. We see this a lot in the Bible. On the way, they get to Micah's house, the guy with the idols. And so they stop by, they spend the night there, and they ask the Levite, well, will we be successful in this? He says, yeah. Very little consultation going on. Sure, you will. It's great. So they go on and they find a place called Laish. It's a peaceful town and very prosperous, probably allied with Sidon because it mentions that it's far away from this very big city. So strategically, this is very good for Dan. Why? Because when they attack it, there's going to be no one to come and help them. Good. So they get back to their people. And everybody agrees. They say, we found the place. So they send 600 warriors. Remember that number too, 600. And they head out. On the way there, they pass by Micah's house. Five guys are like, oh, by the way, there's some goodies in that house. So they go and get it. They steal all these sacred ephod stuff and the idol. And on the way out, the Levite's like, what are you doing? And they're like, stop it. Why don't you come with us? better to be a priest for a whole tribe of Israel than for one man. And so he says, sure, this is great. He goes with them. So now Micah's lost all his goodies, his idol, and his priest, delegitimizing him. He catches up with them, and they threaten him. Ah, we have some hot-tempered guys here. Watch it. They might kill you. And so they go on. Now it says they attack Laish, and they rename it Dan. But then here's something kind of interesting. I notice at least one or two people following along in the word. I want to make a note of something. This is how embarrassing this account was for the Jewish people for years. If you keep reading Judges 18, verse 30, we'll say that they appointed a priest there. And if you're reading an older version, it'll say Manasseh, son Gershom, and then it's the grandson, Jonathan, that they appoint as a priest. If your version says Manasseh instead of Moses, you have my permission to cross it out and change it to Moses, because that's what the original says. Kind of interesting. In the beginning of this series, in the intro, I told you that the Bible of the Christian church was in Greek. It's an older manuscript. It's more accurate. They believed it to be a better translation of the Old Testament. And in that version, it says Moses. And if you know the word well, Manasseh didn't have sons named Gershom and Jonathan. Moses did. Gershom, the grandson. Jonathan. You see, the Jewish people were so embarrassed about this. Idolatry was like the worst thing that they didn't want Moses' name associated with it. So in the Jewish translations and texts, they changed it. So modern versions of the Bible have a little asterisk there if it says Manasseh, and the better ones will say Moses, because that's what it says. I'm done nerding out now. <laughs> So again, they're appearing to be holy, right? But they're a bunch of hypocrites. It's an embarrassing story. Now here, we're going to see a story that most Christians have never heard. I've never heard this in all the time I've been in church. This is not Sunday morning stuff. It's not for the faint of heart. And many pastors are divided on whether they should share the story with their congregations. Judges, 
19, starting at verse 1. Now, in those days, Israel had no king. There was a man from the tribe of Levi living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim. One day, he brought home a woman from Bethlehem in Judah to be his concubine, but she became angry with him and returned to her father's home in Bethlehem. So you have this north-south travel going on a whole lot, and it kind of repeats. So first things first, what's a concubine? I'm not going to assume that you know. Could be a mistress. Could be a second wife. Why is she mad? We don't know. But probably someone's going to make a TV series about it and tell us. <laughs> There's a reason we don't know, because it's not the point. We move on, because that's the way God's telling the story. No speculation here. She's just mad at him. She goes to her dad's house. About four months later, takes him a little while, he goes to retrieve the concubine. Okay, he gets there, and the dad is really hospitable. They spend three days feasting. They're having a good time. And it begins to remind you, if you know the word, of the Jacob and Laban account, like he's being detained for some reason. Could speculate. Maybe it's because he doesn't want his daughter to go. I don't know. Not the point of the story, right? So he gets detained for a couple more days. He doesn't go on for 20 years. He gets out of there in about five days, saddles up his two donkeys, his servant brings his concubine, and heads out. On his way, his servant says, we've got to spend the night somewhere. Let's go to Jebus, this Jebusite town. Now, if you know the word really well, this place becomes Jerusalem, a really, really important city. But the Levite says, no, we're not going to stay in a foreign town where there's no Israelites. I guess he thinks that's unsafe. So they get to Gibeah. Now, you've got to know that Gibeah is a Benjamite town. This is another tribe of Israel. So they figure they're going to be safe there in Gibeah. It'll be an important town later. So they go in the town square, even though they have all their provisions, which means they're not going to be a burden to anybody. Nobody's letting them in. So they're out there in the town square, and this old man approaches them. He's coming home from work. They have a conversation, and they tell him what's going on. Nobody's letting us in, even though we have all the things we need. He says, oh, come stay with me. No problem. But whatever you do, don't stay in the town square. He knows something. So they go to the house. They're having a good time. Wash the feet. Tradition back then, something you did. Got ready for dinner. They're eating and feasting until there's a knock at the door. A bunch of troublemakers, a mob is out there waiting. And they demand that they send the Levi out so that they can have their way with him. Now, this should be reminding you of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's very, very similar. But an interesting exchange happens. The old man, trying to be hospitable, talks to him and he says, no, 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 you can have my virgin daughter and his concubine. He's taking some liberties here. And they say, no, we want the man. So the Levite shoves his concubine out the door. <laughs> Think about it for a second. All the trouble that he went through to get this bride concubine back, and that was the first thing he does. Right? He's not going to protest. He's not going to put up a fight. Maybe he should fight. Let's fight. Nope. Later, <laughs> he goes back. I don't know. I guess he returns to his feasting. We don't know, but... We do know that the townspeople do have their way with her. It's horrible until dawn. He gets up in the morning, finishes his paper and his coffee, opens the door, sees her lying there. All right, let's go. Get up. That's his response. But she doesn't respond because she's dead. They've killed her. But I want you to think about it. This is this Levite, right? like this holy man of God, this priest. He knows what has been done to her. Get up, let's go. Hypocrite. Crazy story. So, he brings the body back home. What do you think he does? Well, let's read it. Judges 19, 29, when he got home, he took a knife and cut his concubine's body into 12 pieces. Then he sent one piece to each tribe throughout all the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said such a horrible crime has not been committed in all the time since Israel left Egypt. Think about it. What are we going to do? Who's going to speak up? 
Now, I'm sure you can see why some pastors are divided about teaching on this. Bad, very bad. Judges 20, starting at verse 1. Then all the Israelites were united as one man, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, including those from across the Jordan in the land of Gilead. The entire community assembled in the presence of the Lord at Mitzvah, the leaders of all the people and all the tribes of Israel, 400,000 warriors armed with swords, took their positions in the assembly of the people of God, were soon reached the land of Benjamin that the other tribes had gone up to Mitzvah. The Israelites then asked how this terrible crime had happened. Now, <laughs> the Levite gets up and explains it to them. So he's sent all these pieces of the body to get everybody riled up. That's the point. So he explains what happened, but his story's a little different. He says, well, the men there were going to kill me. He leaves out what they really wanted to do to him. And then he says, well, so they had their way with my concubine, leaving out the whole part about shoving her out the door. <laughs> so they ask Benjamin, give up the guys that did this. We don't want the guys that did this. They say, nope. Instead, they assemble 26,000 of their own warriors along with 700 men from Gilead. It says that they're left-handed, remember Ehud? They're left-handed and they can use a sling really, really well with pinpoint accuracy, so to speak. So now it's 400,000 guys against 26,700 people from Benjamin. And they're praying through it, but they experience two losses. I believe it's 22,000 on the first loss, 18,000 on the second. They're saying, why, Lord? Why has this happened? They're worshiping. He says, no, go ahead. I'll give you the victory this time. And they get it. They implement a little more strategy this time, kind of like we saw in Joshua with AI. And then it says this, Judges 20, 46. So that day, the tribe of Benjamin lost 25,000 strong warriors armed with swords, leaving only 600,000 men who escaped to the Rock of Rimmon, where they lived for four months, four months again. And the Israelites returned and slaughtered every living thing in all the towns. The people, the livestock, and everything they found, they also burned down all the towns they came to. Remember 600 men? 600 men. There's some men they lose in the middle there, if you're good at math. Heather was like, hey, that doesn't add up. There's only 600 men, that's the point. But here's the strange thing. Now all of a sudden, all these tribes, they have this remorse. They're like, oh no. All of a sudden they went from wanting to destroy all of them to saying, well, we can't have a tribe of Israel wiped out. Judges 21.1, the Israelites vowed at Mitzpah, we will never give our daughters in marriage to a man from the tribe of Bethlehem. So they made these vows there. Now the people went to Bethel and sat in the presence of God until evening, weeping loudly and bitterly. O oh Lord, God of Israel, they cried out, why has this happened in Israel? Now one of our tribes is missing from Israel. Maybe because you killed all of them. Just an idea. So how do we repopulate Benjamin? Let's think on it for a minute. They also made another vow at Mitzvah. They said, well, anyone who doesn't go with us to the assembly, right, to fight against Benjamin, will kill him. It's another vow. And so they realized that the people from Jabesh Gilead did not go. Great. So they killed all of them except the virgins. There were 400. After doing the math, leaves them 200 short. Gee, I wonder what we should do to get the other 200 brides. Oh, they remembered that there's a festival to the Lord at Shiloh. So here's what you do, Benjamites. You wait in ambush for them. And it seems kind of comical if you step back and read it. And when they come out dancing in the fields, you're going to grab them and kidnap them. <laughs> so I imagine throwing one of them on the shoulder and running off. <laughs> Crazy. So I guess two wrongs make a right. Judges 21, starting at verse 23. So the men of Benjamin did as they were told. Each man caught one of the women, as she danced in the celebration and carried her off to be his wife. They returned to their own land and they rebuilt their towns and lived in them. Then the people of Israel departed by tribes and families and they returned to their own homes. In those days, Israel had no king and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Crazy stories. But... Do we also do what is right in our own eyes and turn a blind eye 
towards certain things. Last week, we learned about Samson being blinded. Before that, I told you about Saul becomes Paul. He's blinded. They both did what they thought was right in their own eyes until they were blinded. Both were great on the outside. In Paul's case, he had a lot of credentials. Paul thought he was right by the standards of the law and the world. Like the priests or Levites, he was a Pharisee, a religious leader, blameless according to the law, according to outward appearances. He did what was right in his own eyes until Jesus took away his ability to use them. Remember the Damascus Road. He's blinded with a flash of light for three days. And this forces him to look inwardly, to use the eyes of his heart. He writes in Ephesians to the church, there's a lot of prayers interwoven in that beautiful letter. One of them says this, Ephesians 1.18, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Paul has hope for the people called by God that they can see with the eyes of their heart, not outward appearances. But this translation misses a little something. I like to use an easy-to-read translation on Sunday because the Bible's already kind of hard to understand. So it's just an easy-to-read translation. But when it misses something, I'll point it out. Don't worry. And so here we have the Greek. And I don't expect you to be able to read that. <laughs> so I did some translating for you. We have like one person watching online who can read that. <laughs> but the point is it's really beautiful. Why it says flooded with light is because it's like being enlightened. But the word light is stuck in there. So being enlightened, being flooded with light, it's like kind of a big thought there. But it says the eyes of the heart, not outward eyes flooded with light, but the heart being enlightened. Think about it. How do you enlighten your heart? It's deep. A lot to chew on there in the Greek. It says, I want your heart to be enlightened, to be flooded with light, which is why it says that, a little easier to understand. Jesus blinded Paul in this flash of light, which caused him to look inwardly. Now, Jesus says this in Luke's gospel account, Luke 11, starting at verse 34, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant, as though a floodlight were filling your heart. If we continue reading, he then criticizes those who are like the Levites and judges or the Pharisees like Saul. Luke eleven thirty seven. 37, as Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, you Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness. Fools! Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you'll be clean all over. Jesus calls people like that blind guides in Matthew 23. I'll read you a little bit of it. Matthew 23, starting at verse 5. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. But if we continue reading, verse 13, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others in either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell. You yourselves are blind guides. What sorrow awaits you? Blind guides. A lot of people don't know that Jesus talked like that. <laughs> Is that in the show? The scathing rebuke of these hypocrites continues <laughs> for a while. Like the Levites in Judges or the Pharisees in the Gospels, do we too do what is wrong under the guise of doing what is right? Samson in the book of Judges, he appears to be very strong on the outside, but inside has many weaknesses. And we close the book of Judges with a string of stories that all have a common thread. All of them claim to be doing something right while doing something very wrong. Whether it be Micah or his mother, the young Levite, the Danites, the Levite and the concubine, the hospitable host, the tribe of Benjamin. The section itself begins with an admission of guilt, theft, then an unrighteous act. Remember, it's Judges 17.3. He returned the money to her and she said, I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord. Good. In honor of my son, I will have an image carved in an idol cast. And that section ends. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And the book ends, Judges 21.25. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Just like this story often gets left out. It's embarrassing, maybe. Redacted from many programs. Do we also leave out parts of our story? This section is difficult. Difficult passages of Scripture. Leaves us with lots of questions. It's gritty. The Jewish people thought it was embarrassing. But are parts of our story embarrassing too? Do we treat this as a buffet, taking what we like? Do Christians as individuals post themselves out there online as one thing? Post scriptures, right? Like the Pharisees with the scripture verses hanging out and the tassels. Ooh. We should all do this. You should read this scripture, but then turn around online and look at something they shouldn't. Immediately after. Do we dress up as someone who is holy, but then turn around and do something that's not? Like the Pharisees. Are there religious leaders today who go around doing very selfish things under the guise of doing what is right? We see so many Celebrity pastors nowadays falling from grace like the rotten trees. From pastors to people, do we get dressed up for church, spend lots of time doing our hair and our makeup, but on the inside, it's not so pretty? Do we put up a front? Here at C3, we believe in transparency in word and deed, from the leadership to the flock. That's what it means to be real. Real church, real people. But that doesn't mean going around doing whatever we want, although some have translated it that way, sadly. Real church, real people means doing Christianity genuinely. It means taking off the mask, asking for help when we need it. We're all going through something. So let's be real with one another. That's what it means to be real church, real people. You see, we all have something. And in order to heal it, we need to be real about it. That's the only way it's going to happen. We have to acknowledge it. Because when we don't, it's like a cancer inside us. It rots us from the inside out. And the longer we let it go, the more difficult it is to heal. 
We shouldn't be doing life alone. So practically, if you haven't already, I want to encourage you. Carol Lee, I think it's Carol Lee today, isn't it? We'll show you some ways in which you can connect with us. Please do that. If you're shy, you're not good at making friends, that's okay. You can use the connection card. You can use our app. She'll show you how to do that. We want you to connect with the body of Christ. Amen? So let me pray for you the way Paul did for Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he, God, has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.